Lord, my learned friend, Selwyn Jones, now deals with the defendant, Rayner. May it please the tribunal, it is my duty to present to the tribunal the evidence against the creator of the Nazi Navy, the defendant Raider. The allegations against him are set out in Appendix A of the indictment at pages 33 and uh, 34. And the tribunal will see that uh, the defendant Raider is charged with promoting and participating in the planning of the Nazi wars of aggression, with executing those plans, and with authorizing, directing, and participating in Nazi war crimes, particularly war crimes arising out of sea warfare. At the outset, the tribunal may find it convenient to look at exhibit 288 PS, which is already before the tribunal, as exhibit US 13, which the tribunal will find at page 96 of the document book. That is a document which sets out the offices and positions held by the defendant Rader. The tribunal will see that he was born in 1876 and joined the German Navy in 1894. Uh, by 1915, he had become commander of the cruiser Köln. In 1928, he became an admiral, uh, chief of naval command, and head of the German Navy. In 1935, he became commander-in-chief of the Navy. In uh, 1936, he became General Admiral, a creation uh, of Hitler's uh, on his 47th birthday. In 1937, he received the high Nazi honor of Golden Badge of Honor of the Nazi Party. In 1938, he became a member of the Secret Cabinet Council and in 1939, he reached the empire of Gross Admiral, a rank created by Hitler, who presented Raider with a marshal's baton. In 1943, he became Admiral Inspector uh, of the uh, German Navy, which, as the tribunal will shortly see, was a kind of retirement into oblivion because from January 1943 on, as the tribunals heard, Dönitz was the effective commander of the German Navy. In these eventful years of Raider's command of the German Navy, from 1928 to 1943, he played a vital role. And I would like, in the first instance, to draw the tribunal's attention to Raider's part in building up the German Navy as an instrument of war to implement the Nazis' general plan of aggression. The tribunal is by now familiar with the steps by which the small navy permitted to Germany under the Treaty of Versailles was enormously expanded under the guidance of Raider. And uh, I will do no more than to remind the tribunal of some of the milestones upon Raider's road to Nazi mastery of the seas, which mercifully he was unable to attain. Uh, with regard to the story of Germany's secret rearmament in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, I would refer the court to the document C156, which is, which is uh, already before the court as US 41, and which the tribunal will find at page 26 of the document book. That document, as the 
tribunal will remember was uh, a history of the fight of the German Navy against Versailles, 1919 to 35, which was published secretly by the German Admiralty in 1937. And the tribunal will remember uh, that that history shows that before the Nazis came to power, the German Admiralty was deceiving not only the governments of other countries, but its own legislature, and at one stage, its own government. Uh, their secret measures of rearmament, ranging from experimental U-boat and E-boat building to the creation of secret intelligence and finance organizations. I only propose to trouble the tribunal with a reference to the last paragraph at page 33 of the document book, which refers to the role of Raider uh, in this development. It is an extract from page 75 of this uh, document C156, and it reads, the Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, Admiral Raider, has received hereby a far-reaching independence in the building and development of the Navy. This was only hampered insofar as the previous concealment of rearmament had to be continued in consideration of the Versailles Treaty. As an illustration of Raider's concealment of rearmament, I would remind the tribunal of the document C-141, United States Exhibit 47, which is at page 22 of the document book. Uh, in that document, Rader states that in view of Germany's treaty obligations and the disarmament conference, steps must be taken to prevent the first e-boat half flotilla from appearing openly as a formation of torpedo-carrying boats, as it was not intended to count these e-boats against the number of torpedo-carrying boats allowed them. The next document, C-135, which will be exhibit GB-213, and which is at page 20 of the document book is of unusual interest because it suggests that even in 1930, the intention ultimately to attack Poland was already current in German military circles. Uh, this document is an extract from the history of war organization and of the scheme for mobilization. The German text of this document is headed A2850 oblique 38, which suggests that the document was written in the year 1938. Uh, the extracts uh, read, since under the Treaty of Versailles all preparations for mobilization were forbidden, these were at first confined to a very small body of collaborators and were at first only of a theoretical nature. Nevertheless, there existed at that time an establishment order, instructions for establishment, the forerunners of the present day scheme for mobilization. Just a little more slowly. If your lordship pleases. <coughs> uh, an establishment organization and adaptable instructions for establishment were drawn up for each A year, cover name for mobilization year. As stated, the establishment organization of that time uh, were, were to be judged purely theoretically, for they had no positive basis in the form of men and materials. They provided, nevertheless, a valuable foundation for the establishment of a war organization as our ultimate aim. 
paragraph two. The crises between Germany and Poland, which were becoming increasingly acute, compelled us, instead of making theoretical preparations for war, to prepare in a practical manner for a purely German-Polish conflict. The strategic idea of a rapid forcing of the Polish base of Gdynia was made a basis, and the fleet on active service was to be reinforced by the auxiliary forces which would be indispensable to attain this strategic end. And the essential coastal and flak batteries, especially those in Pilar and Svinemunda, were to be taken over. Thus, in 1930, the reinforcement plan was evolved. <clears throat> if the tribunal turns over the page to paragraph three, to the uh, second uh, paragraph, Hitler had made a clear political request to build up for him in five years, that is to say, by the by the 1st of April 1938, armed forces which he could place in the balance as an instrument of political power. Now that entry is a, a pointer to the fact that the Nazi seizure of power in 1933 was a signal to Rada to go full speed ahead on rearmament. The detailed story of this development has already been told by my American colleague, Mr. Alderman. And I would simply refer the court in the first place to the document C-189, exhibit US-44, which is at page 66 of the document. In that document, Rader tells Hitler in June 1934 that the German fleet must be developed to oppose England and that therefore from 1936 on the big ships must be armed with big guns to match the British King George class of battleship. It further in the last paragraph refers to Hitler's demand that the construction of U-boats should be kept completely secret, especially in view of the Saar plebiscite. In November 1934, Rader had a further talk with Hitler on the financing of naval rearmament. And on that occasion, Hitler told him that in case of need, he would get, get Dr. Lai to put 120 to 150 million from the labor front at the disposal of the Navy. That, the reference to that is the document C-190, exhibit US-45, at page 67 of the document book. And uh, the tribunal uh, may think that that proposed fraud upon the German working people was a characteristic Nazi manifestation. Next document which I desire to draw to the tribunal's attention is the document C-23, uh, exhibit US-49, at page 3 of the document book, which uh, states that the true displacement of certain German battleships exceeded by 20% the displacement reported to the British. Uh, and that, uh, I submit, is typical of Raider's use of deceit. The next document to which I wish to refer briefly is C-166, exhibit US-48, at page 36 of the document book. <coughs> is another such deceitful document which orders that auxiliary cruisers which were being secretly constructed should be referred to as transport ships O.
then there is the document C-29, U.S. 46, at page 8 of the document book. which is signed by Rader and deals with the support given by the German Navy to the German armament industry. And I submit is an illustration of Rader's concern with the broader aspects of Nazi policy and of the close link between Nazi politicians, German service chiefs and German armament manufacturers. A final commentary on the... Put in before? That had been put in before, yeah. my lord, as a, a exhibit US 46. Mm -hmm. A final commentary on the post-1933 naval rearmament uh, is the document C-155 at page 24 of the document book, which is a new document and will be Exhibit GB214, and uh, is a letter from Rader to the German Navy dated the 11th of June 1940. And the original, which uh, has been submitted to the tribunal, shows the very wide distribution of this letter. Uh, there, there is provision in the distribution list for 467 copies. A and this letter of Raiders is a letter both of self-justification and of apology. It, uh, the extracts read, the most outstanding of the numerous subjects <coughs> of discussion in the officer corps are the torpedo position. And the problem whether the naval building program up to autumn 1939 envisaged the possibility of the outbreak of war as early as 1939, or whether the emphasis ought not to have been laid from the first <coughs> on the construction of U-boats. If the opinion is voiced in the officer corps that the entire naval building program has been wrongly directed, and that from the first, the emphasis should have been on the U-boat weapon, and after its consolidation on the large ships, I must emphasize the following matters. The building up of the fleet was directed according to the political demands which were decided by the Führer. The Führer hoped until the last moment to be able to put off the threatening conflict with England until 1944-45. At that time, the Navy would have had available a fleet with a powerful U-boat superiority and a much more favorable ratio as regards strength in all other types of ships, particularly those designed for warfare on the high seas. The development of events forced the Navy, contrary to the expectation even of the Führer, into a war, which it had to accept while still in the initial stage of its rearmament. The result is that those who represent the opinion that the emphasis should have been laid from the start on the building of the U-boat arm appear to be right. I leave undiscussed how far this development, quite apart from difficulties of personnel, training and dockyards, could have been appreciably improved in any way in view of the political limits of the Anglo-German Naval Treaty. I leave also undiscussed how the early and necessary creation of an effective air force slowed down the desirable development of the other branches of the forces. I indicate, however, with pride the admirable and, in spite of the political restraints in the years of the Weimar Republic, far-reaching preparation for U-boat construction, which made the immensely rapid construction of the U-boat arm, both as regards equipment and personnel possible immediately after the assumption of power. There is here, the tribunal sees no trace of reluctance in cooperating with the Nazi program. On the contrary, the evidence points to the fact 
Raider welcomed and became one of the pillars of Nazi power. And it will now be my purpose to uh, develop the relationship between Raider, the Navy, and the Nazi party. The prosecution submission is that Raider, more than anyone else, was responsible for securing the unquestioned allegiance of the German Navy to the Nazi movement, an allegiance which Dönitz was to make even more firm and fanatical. Raider's approval of Hitler was shown particularly clearly on the 2nd of August 1939, the day of Hindenburg's death uh, of uh, 1934, the day of Hindenburg's death when he and all the men under him swore a new oath of loyalty with considerable ceremony, this time to Adolf Hitler and no longer to the fatherland. The oath is found in the document D481 at page 101 of the document book. <coughs> that will be exhibit GB215, page 101 of the document book. And it may be of interest to the court to see what the new oath was. Yes. The last paragraph reads, the service oath of the soldiers of the armed forces is worded as follows. I swear this holy oath by God that I will implicitly obey the leader of the German Reich and people, Adolf Hitler, the supreme commander of the armed forces, and that as a brave soldier, I will be willing to stake my life at any time for this oath. The tribunal will see that for his fatherland, Raider substituted a Führer. I am not proposing to take the tribunal's time with reiterating the steps by which the German Navy was progressively drawn into the closest alliance with the Nazi party. I would remind the court of facts of history like the incorporation of the swastika into the ensign under which the German fleet sailed and the wearing of the swastika on the uniforms of naval officers and men, which are facts which, are, which speak for themselves. The Nazis, for their part, were not ungrateful for Raider's obeisance and collaboration. His uh, services in rebuilding the German navy, navy were widely recognized by Nazi propagandists and by the <coughs> Nazi press. On his 66th birthday, the chief party organ, the Völkischer Beobachter, published a special article about him to which I desire to draw the tribunal's attention. It is at page 100 of the document, document book. It is the document D448, exhibit 216, GB. <coughs> it is a valuable summing up of Raider's contribution to uh, Nazi development. It was to Raider's credit, writes the Völkische Beobachter, to have already built up by that time a powerful striking force from the numerically small fleet despite the fetters of Versailles. With the assumption of power through national socialism began to the most fruitful period in the reconstruction of the German fleet. The Führer openly expressed his recognition of Raider's faithful services and unstinted cooperation by appointing him General Admiral on the 20th of April, 1936. Does this now, add anything to Owen Jones? I was going to turn to the last paragraph but one, my lord, which I think is helpful. As a soldier and a seaman, the General Admiral has proved himself to be the Führer's first and foremost naval collaborator, which in my submission is a summing up of his uh, status and position <coughs> in Nazi Germany. I now propose to deal with Raider's personal part in the Nazi conspiracy. The evidence indicates that 
Raider from the time of the Nazi seizure of power became increasingly involved in responsibility for the general policies of the Nazi state. Long before he was promoted to General Admiral in 1936, he had become a member of the very secret Reich Defense Council, joining it when it was founded on the 4th of April, 1933. And thus, at an early date, he was involved both militarily and politically in the Nazi conspiracy. The relevant document upon that is the document EC-177, United States Exhibit 390, at page 68 of the document book, which I would remind the tribunal contains the classic Nazi directive, matters communicated orally cannot be proven, they can be denied by us at Geneva. On the 4th of February, 1938, Rader was appointed to be a member of a newly formed secret advisory council for foreign affairs. Authority for that statement is Exhibit 2031 PS, at page 88 of the document book, which will be exhibit GB217. Three weeks after this, a decree of Hitler's stated that as well as being equal in rank with a cabinet minister, Rader was also to take part in the sessions of the cabinet. That uh, has already been established in the document 2098 PS, which was submitted as GB206. In my submission, therefore, it is thus clear that Raider's responsibility for the political decisions of the Nazi state was steadily developed from 1933 to 1938, and that in the course of time he became a member of all the main political advisory bodies. And uh, he was indeed very much a member of the inner councils of the conspirators, and I submit must carry with them the responsibility for the acts that led to the German invasion of Poland in 1939 and the outbreak of war. As an illustration, I would remind the tribunal that Rader was present at two of the key meetings at which Hitler openly declared his intention of attacking neighboring countries. They are the documents 386 PS, which is US 25, and is found at page 81 of the document book, which the tribunal will remember is the record of Hitler's conference at the Reich Chancellery on the 5th of November, 1937, about matters which were said to be too important to discuss in the larger circle of the Reich cabinet. And a document which, as Mr. Alderman submitted, establishes conclusively that the Nazis premeditated their crimes against peace. And then there was the other conference of Hitler's on the 23rd of May, 1939, the minutes of which are found in the document L79, United States Exhibit 27, at page 74 of the document book, that the tribunal will remember was the conference at which Hitler confirmed his intention to make a deliberate attack upon Poland at the first opportunity, well knowing that this must cause widespread war in Europe. Now those two were key conferences. At many, many others, Rader was also present to place his knowledge and his professional skill at the service of the Nazi war machine. His active promotion of the military planning and preparation for the Polish campaign is by now well known to the tribunal, and I'm not proposing to reiterate that evidence again. Once the war did start, however, the defendant Raider showed himself to be a master 
of the most typical of the conspirators' techniques, namely that of deceit on the grand scale. There are few better examples of this allegation than that of his handling of the case of the Athena. The Athena, as the tribunal will be aware, was a passenger liner which was sunk in the evening of the 3rd of September 1939 when she was outward bound to America, about a hundred lives being lost. On the 23rd of October 1939, the Nazi party paper, the Völkische Beobachter, published in screaming headlines the story, Churchill sank the Athenian. I would refer the court to exhibit 3260PS at page uh, 97 of the document book, which will be exhibit GB218. And I would like the tribunal to look for a moment at the copy of the Völkische Beobachter here, to see the scale with which this deliberate lie was perpetrated. I have a photostat of the relevant page of the Völkische Beobachter for that day. That is the third page. And the tribunal will see that on this front page with a big red underlining, there are the words, now we indict Churchill. The extract from the Völkische Beobachter, which is at page 97 of the document book, reads as follows. Churchill sank the Athena. The above picture, the tribunal will see it is a fine picture of this fine ship, shows the proud Athena, the ocean giant, which was sunk by Churchill's crime. One can clearly see the big radio equipment on board the ship but nowhere was an SOS heard from the ship. Why was the Athena silent? Because her captain was not allowed to tell the world anything. He very, very prudently refrained from telling the world that Winston Churchill attempted to sink the ship through the explosion of an infernal machine. He knew it well, but he had to keep silent. Nearly 1,500 people would have lost their lives if Churchill's original plan had resulted as the criminal wanted. Yes, he longingly hoped that the hundred Americans on board the ship would find death in the waves, so that the anger of the American people who were deceived by him should be directed against Germany as the presumed author of the deed. It was fortunate that the majority escaped the fate intended for them by Churchill. Our picture on the right shows two wounded passengers. They were rescued by the freighter city of Flint, and as can be seen here, turned over to the American Coast Guard boat, Gibb, for further medical treatment. They are an unspoken accusation against the criminal Churchill. Both they and the shades of those who lost their lives call him before the tribunal of the world and ask the British people how long will the office, one of the richest in tradition, known to Britain's history, be held by a murderer? Now, in view of the maliciousness uh, of this Völkische Beobachter announcement, and in fairness to the men of the British Merchant Navy, I think it is proper that I should say that contrary to the allegation in this Nazi sheet, the Athenia, of course, made repeated wireless distress signals, which were in fact intercepted and answered by His Majesty's ships Electra and Escort, as well as by the Norwegian steamship Newt Nelson and the yacht Southern Cross. <coughs> I shall submit evidence to the tribunal to establish that in fact the Athenia was sunk by the German U-boat U-30. So unjustifiable was the torpedoing of the Athena, however, 
that the German Navy embarked upon a course of falsification of their records and on other dishonest measures in the hope of hiding this guilty secret. And for their part, as the tribunal has seen, the Nazi propagandists indulged in their favorite falsehood of seeking the sh to shift the responsibility to the British. The captain of the U-30, Oberleutnant Lemp, was later killed in action. But some of the original crew of the U-30 have survived to tell the tale, and they are now prisoners of war. And so that the truth as to this episode may be placed beyond a peradventure, I submit to the tribunal an affidavit by a member of the crew of the U-30 as to the think sinking of the Athena and as to one aspect of the attempt to conceal the true facts. I refer to the document D-654, exhibit GB-219, at page 106 of the document. The affidavit reads, I, Adolf Schmidt, official number N104333T, t do solemnly declare that I am now confined to camp number 133, Lethbridge, Alberta. That on the first day of war, 3rd September 1939, a ship of approximately 10,000 tons was torpedoed in the late hours of the evening by the U-30. That after the ship was torpedoed and we surfaced again, approximately half an hour after the explosion, the commandant called me to the tower in order to show me the torpedoed ship. That I have seen the ship with my very eyes, but that I do not think that the ship could see our U-boat at that time on account of the position of the moon that only a few members of the crew had an opportunity to go to the tower in order to see the torpedoed ship. That apart from myself, Oberleutnant Hinch was in the tower when I saw the steamer after the attack. That I observed that the ship was listing. That no warning shot was fired before the torpedo was launched. That I myself observed much commotion on board of the torpedoed ship that I believe that the ship had only one smokestack, that in the attack on this steamer, one or two torpedoes were fired, which did not explode, but that I myself have heard the explosion of the torpedo which hit the steamer, that Oberleutnant Lemp waited until darkness before surfacing. <coughs> that I was severely wounded by aircraft on the 14th of September, 1939, that Oberleutnant Lemp, shortly after my disembarkation in Reykjavik on the 19th of September 1939, visited me in the forenoon in the petty officer's quarters where I was lying severely wounded. That Oberleutnant Lemp then had the petty officer's quarters cleared in order to be alone with me. That Oberleutnant Lemp then showed me a declaration under oath, according to which I had to bind myself to mention nothing concerning the incidents of the 3rd of September 1939 on board the U-30, that this declaration under oath had approximately the following wording. I, the undersigned, swear hereby that I shall shroud in secrecy all happenings of the 3rd September 1939 on board the U-30, regardless whether foe or friend, and that I shall erase from my memory all happenings of this day. That I have signed this declaration under oath, which was drawn up by the commandant in his own, in his own handwriting, with my left hand very illegibly. That later on in Iceland, when I heard about the sinking of the Athena, the idea came into my mind that the U-30 on the 3rd September 1939 might have sunk the Athena, especially since the captain caused me to sign the above-mentioned declaration. 
that up to today I have never spoken to anyone concerning these events that due to the termination of the war, I consider myself freed from my oaths. Dönitz is part in the Athena episode is described in an affidavit which he has sworn, which is exhibit D638, exhibit GB220, at page 102 of the document book. The affidavit was sworn in English, and I invite the tribunal to look at it and observe the addition in Dönitz's handwriting of four words at the end of the affidavit, the significance of which will be seen in a moment. The defendant Dönitz states, U-30 returned to harbor about mid-September. I met the captain, Oberleutnant Lemp, on the lock side at Wilhelmshaven as the boat was entering harbor, and he asked permission to speak to me in private. I noticed immediately that he was looking very unhappy, and he told me at once that he, that he thought he was responsible for the sinking of the Athenia in the North Channel area. In accordance with my previous instructions, he had been keeping a sharp lookout for possible armed merchant cruisers in the approaches to the British Isles, and had torpedoed a ship he afterwards identified as the Athenia from wireless broadcasts, under the impression that she was an armed merchant cruiser on patrol. I had never specified in my instructions any particular type of ship as armed merchant cruiser, nor mentioned any names of ships. I dispatched Lemp at once by air to report to the SKL at Berlin. In the meantime, I ordered complete secrecy as a provisional measure. Later in the same day, or early on the following day, I received a verbal order from Captain Surze Fricker, who was head of the operations division of the Naval War Staff, that firstly, the affair was to be kept a total secret, Secondly, the OKM considered that a court-martial was not necessary, as they were satisfied that the captain had acted in good faith. Thirdly, political explanations would be handled by the OKM. I had had no part whatsoever in the political events in which the Führer claimed that no U-boat had sunk the Athena. After Lemp returned to Wilhelmshaven from Berlin, I interrogated him thoroughly on the sinking and formed the impression that, that although he had taken reasonable care, he had still not taken sufficient precautions to establish fully the identity of the ship before attacking. I had previously given very strict orders that all merchant vessels and neutrals were to be treated according to naval prize law before the occurrence of this incident. I accordingly placed him under cabin arrest as I felt certain that a court-martial could only acquit him and would entail unnecessary publicity and then Dönitz has added the words and too much time. It is right, I think, that I should add that Dönitz's suggestion that the captain of the U-30 sank the Athena in mistake for a merchant cruiser must be considered in the light of a document which Colonel Fillimore submitted, the document C-191, exhibit GB-193, dated the 22nd of September, 1939, in this period, uh, which contained Dönitz's order that the sinking of a merchant ship must be justified in the war diary as due to possible confusion with a warship or an auxiliary cruiser. Now the U-30 
return to Wilhelmshaven on the 27th of September, 1939. I submit another fraudulent naval document, Exhibit D659, page 110 of the document book, which uh, will be Exhibit GB221, which is an extract from the war diary of the chief of U-boats. Oh, and it is an extract for the 27th of September, 1939. The tribunal uh, will see that it reads, U-30 comes in, she had sunk, SS Blair Logie, SS Fannard Head. No reference at all, of course, to the sinking of the Athena. <coughs> but perhaps the most elaborate forgery in connection with this episode was the forgery of the logbook of the U-30 which was responsible for sinking the Athena. And I now submit that original logbook to the tribunal. It is document D-662, which will be GB-222, and is and, uh, an extract from the first and relevant page of it is found at page 111 of the document book. I would like the tribunal to examine the original, if you'll be good enough to do so, because the prosecution submission is that the first page of that logbook is a forgery, but a forgery which shows a curiously un-German carelessness about details. The tribunal will see that the first page of the text is a clear substitute for pages that have been removed. The dates in the first column of that page, which contains the date the 3rd of September and other entries, The dates in the first column of that page are in Arabic numerals. On the second and more authentic looking page, and throughout the other pages of the logbook, they are in Roman numerals. The tribunal will also see that all reference to the action of the sinking of the Athenia on the 3rd of September is omitted. The <coughs> entries are translated in page 111 of the document book for the court's assistance. The logbook shows that the position at 1400 hours on, of the U-30 on the 3rd of September is given as AL-0278, which the tribunal will notice is one of the very few positions quoted at all uh, upon that page and which was in fact some 200 miles west of the position where the Athenia was sunk. The course due south, which is recorded in the logbook, and the speed of 10 knots, those entries are obviously designed to suggest that the U-30 was well clear of the Athenia's position uh, on the 3rd of September. Finally, and most curiously, the tribunal will observe that Lemp's own signature upon the page dealing with the 3rd of September differs from the other signatures in the text. Page 1 shows Lemp's signature with a Roman P as the final letter of his name on the other signatures there is a script P and the inference I submit is that either the signature is a forgery or it was made up by Lemp at some other and probably considerably later date. Now in my submission the whole of this Athenia story establishes that the German Navy under radar embarked upon deliberate fraud. Even before receiving Lemp's reports, the German Admiralty had repeatedly denied the possibility 
that a German U-boat was could be in the area concerned. The charts which showed the disposition of U-boats and the position of sinking of the Athena, uh, which Colonel Fillimore introduced, uh, have shown the utter dishonesty of these announcements. And my submission upon this matter is this. Raider, as head of the German Navy, knew all the facts. Censorship and information control in Nazi Germany were so complete that Raider, as head of the Navy, must have been party to the falsification published in the Völkische Beobachter, which was a wholly dishonorable attempt by the Nazi conspirators to save their faces with their own people and to uphold the myth of an infallible Führer backed by an impeccable war machine. The tribunal has seen that truth mattered little in Nazi propaganda, and it would appear that Raider's camouflage was not confined to painting his ships or sailing them under the British flag as he did in attacking Norway and Denmark. Uh, with regard to that last matter, the invasion of Norway and Denmark, I think it is hardly necessary that I should remind the tribunal of Raider's leading part in that perfidious Nazi assault, the evidence as to which uh, has already been presented. I think I need only add Raider's proud comment upon those brutal invasions, which is contained in his letter in document C-155 at page 25 of the document book, which will be GB-2, which is uh, already before the tribunal as GB-214. <coughs> that document, which is a letter of raiders to the Navy, part of which I've already read, <coughs> states, the operations of the Navy in the occupation of Norway will for all time remain the great contribution of the Navy to this war. Now with the occupation of Norway and of much of Western Europe uh, safely completed, the tribunal has seen that Hitler turned his eyes towards Russia. Now in fairness to Raider, it is right that I should say that Raider himself was against the attack on Russia and tried his best to dissuade Hitler from embarking upon it. The documents show, however, that Raider approached the problem with complete cynicism. He didn't object to the aggressive war on Russia because of its illegality, its immorality, its inhumanity. His only objection to it was its untimeliness. He wanted to finish England first before going further afield. The story of Raider's part in the deliberations upon the war against Russia is told in the document C-170, which is at page 37 of the document book, and uh, which has already been submitted as US 136. <coughs> that document uh, consists of extracts from a German compilation of official naval notes by the German naval war staff. The first entry at page 47 of the document book uh, for the date the 26th of September 1940, which is at page 11 of C-170, showed that Raider was advocating to Hitler an aggressive Mediterranean policy in which, of course, the Navy would play a paramount role as opposed to a continental land policy. Uh, the entry reads, 
Naval Supreme Commander with the Führer. Naval Supreme Commander presents his opinion about the situation. The Suez Canal must be captured. The Suez Canal must be captured with German assistance. From Suez, advance through Palestine and Syria. Then Turkey in our power. The Russian problem will then assume a different appearance. Russia is fundamentally frightened of Germany. It is questionable whether action against Russia from the north will then be still necessary. The next entry at page 48 of the document book for the 14th of November. Naval Supreme Commander with the Führer. Führer is still inclined to instigate the conflict with Russia. Naval Supreme Commander recommends putting it off until the time after the victory over England, since there is heavy strain on German forces and the end of warfare is not in sight. Then there is an entry at page 50 for the 27th of December, 1940. Naval Supreme Commander with the Führer. Naval Supreme Commander <coughs> emphasizes again that strict concentration of our entire war effort against England as our main enemy is the most urgent need of the hour. On the one side, England has gained strength by the unfortunate Italian conduct of the war in the Eastern Mediterranean and by the increasing American support. On the other hand, however, she can be hit mortally by a strangulation of her ocean traffic, which is already taking effect. What is being done for submarine and naval air force construction is much too little. Our entire war potential must work for the conduct of the war against England. Thus, for Navy and Air Force, every fissure of strength prolongs the voices serious objection against Russia campaign before the defeat of England. At uh, page 52 of the document book on the 18th of February, 1941, there is the entry, Chief Naval Operations, SKL, insists on the occupation of Malta, even before Barbarossa. And on the next page, on the 23rd of February, there is this interesting e entry, instruction from Supreme... <coughs> instruction from Supreme Command, Armed Forces, OKW, that seizure of Malta is contemplated for the fall of 1941 after the execution of Barbarossa, which the tribunal may think is a sublime example of wishful thinking. The next entry for the 19th of March, 1941, which is at page 54 of the document book, shows that by March of 1941, Rader had begun to consider what prospects of naval action the Russian aggression had to offer. He, there is the entry, in case of Barbarossa, Supreme Naval Commander describes the occupation of Murmansk as an absolute necessity for the Navy. Chief of Supreme Command Armed Forces considers compliance very difficult. In the meantime, these, the entries in this document show that Mussolini, the flunky of Nazism, was crying out for a more active Nazi Mediterranean policy. I refer the court to page 57 of the document book, the entry for the 30th of May. The word Duce is missing from the first line, and the entry should read, 
Duce demands urgently decisive offensive Egypt Suez for fall 1941. Twelve divisions needed for that. This stroke would be more deadly to the British Empire than the capture of London. Chief Naval Operations agrees completely. And then, uh, finally, the entry for the 6th of June, indicating uh, the strategic views of Raider and the German Navy at this stage, uh, reads as follows. It's at page 58 of the document book. Supreme Naval Commander with the Führer. Memorandum of the Chief Naval Operations, observation on the strategic situation in the Eastern Mediterranean after the Balkan campaign and the occupation of Crete and further conduct of the war. A few sentences below. The memorandum points with impressive clarity to the decisive aims of the war in the Near East. Their advancement has moved into grasping distance by the successes in the Aegean area. And the memorandum emphasizes that the offensive utilization of the present favorable situation must take place with the greatest acceleration and energy before England has again strengthened her position in the Near East with help from the United States of America. The memorandum realizes the unalterable fact that the campaign against Russia would be opened very shortly. Demands, however, that the undertaking Barbarossa, which because of the magnitude of its aims, naturally stands in the foreground of the operational plans of the armed forces leadership must under no circumstances lead to an abandonment, diminishing or delay of the conduct of the war in the Eastern Mediterranean. So that Rado was throughout seeking an active role for his navy in the Nazi war plans. Now once Hitler had decided to attack Russia, Raider sought a role for the Navy in the campaign against Russia. And the first naval operational plan against Russia was a particularly <coughs> perfidious one. I refer the tribunal to the document C-170, uh, which I have just been reading from at page 59 of the document book. There the tribunal will see an entry for the 15th of June 1941 on the proposal of Chief Naval Operations use of arms against Russian submarines south of the northern boundary of the Poland warning area is permitted immediately ruthless destruction is to be aimed at. <coughs> the defendant Keitel provided a characteristically dishonest pretext for this action in his letter, the document C-38, <coughs> which is at uh, page 11 of the document book, and which will be GB223. The tribunal sees that Keitel's letter is dated the 15th of June, 1941, subject offensive action against enemy submarines in the Baltic Sea, to high command of the Navy. Offensive action against submarines south of the line, Memel, southern tip of Orland, is authorized if the boats cannot be definitely identified as Swedish during the approach by German naval forces. The reason to be given up to B-Day 
is that our naval forces believed to be dealing with penetrating British submarines. Now that was the 15th of June 1941 and the tribunal will remember that the Nazi attack on Russia did not take place until the 22nd of June of 1941. In the meantime, Raider was urging Hitler as early as the 18th of March 1941 to enlarge the scope of the world war by inducing Japan to seize Singapore. The relevant document is C152 GB 122 at page 23 of the document. Just one paragraph, which I would like to be permitted to read. The document describes the audience of the Raider with Hitler on the 18th of March. And the entries in it, uh, in fact, represent Raider's own views. Japan must take steps to seize Singapore as soon as possible, since the opportunity will never again be as favorable whole English fleet contained, unpreparedness of USA for war against Japan, inferiority of US fleet vis-a-vis -vis the Japanese. Japan is indeed making preparations for this action, but according to all declarations made by Japanese officers, she will only carry it out if Germany proceeds to land in England. Germany must therefore concentrate all her efforts on spurring Japan to act immediately. If Japan has Singapore, all other East Asiatic questions regarding the USA and England are thereby solved. Guam, Philippines, Borneo, Dutch, East Indies. Japan wishes, if possible, to avoid war against the USA. She can do so if she determinedly takes Singapore as soon as possible. The Japanese, of course, as events proved, had different ideas from that. On the, by the 20th of April, 1941, the evidence is that Hitler had agreed with this proposition of raiders of inducing the Japanese to take offensive action against Singapore. I would refer the, the tribunal again to the document C-170 and to an entry at page 56 of the document book for the 20th of April, 1941. And a few sentences from that read, Naval Supreme Commander with Führer. Naval Supreme Commander asks about result of Matsuoka's visit and evaluation of Japanese-Russian pact. Führer has informed Matsuoka that Russia will not be touched if she behaves in a friendly manner according to the treaty. Otherwise, he reserves action for himself. Japan-Russia pact has been concluded in agreement with Germany and is to prevent Japan from advancing against Vladivostok and to cause her to attack Singapore. Now, an interesting commentary upon this document is found in the document C-66 at page 13 of the document book. The document C-66 has already been exhibited as GB-81. I would refer the court to paragraph 3 at page 13 of the document book. 
At that time, the Führer was firmly resolved on a surprise attack on Russia, regardless of what was the Russian attitude to Germany. This, according to reports coming in, was frequently changing. And there follows this interesting sentence, the communication to Matsuoka was designed entirely as a camouflage measure and to ensure surprise. The ex's partners were not even honest with each other. And uh, this, I submit, is typical of the kind of jungle diplomacy with which Raider associated himself. I now, with the tribunal's permission, turn from the field of diplomacy to the final aspect of the case against Raider, namely to crimes at sea. The prosecution submission is that Raider, throughout his career, showed a complete disregard for any international rule or usage of war which conflicted in the slightest with his intention of carrying through the Nazi program of conquest. I submit, I, I propose to submit to the tribunal only a few examples of raiders flouting of the laws and customs of civilized states. Raider has himself summarized his attitude uh, in a most admirable fashion in the document UK 65, which the tribunal will find at page 98 of the document book and which will be exhibit GB 224. Now that document UK 65 is a very long memorandum compiled by Raider and the German naval war staff on the 15th of October, 1939. That is to say, only a few weeks after the war started. And it is a memorandum on the subject of the intensification of the war at sea. And I desire to draw the tribunal's attention to the bottom paragraph at page 98 of the document book. It is headed, Possibilities of Future, future Naval Warfare. One, military requirements for the decisive struggle against Great Britain. Our naval strategy will have to employ all of the military means at our disposal as expeditiously as possible. Military success can be most confidently expected if we attack British sea communications wherever they, ac they are accessible to us with the greatest ruthlessness. The final aim of such attacks is to cut off all imports into and exports from Britain. We should try to consider the interest of neutrals insofar as this is possible without detriment to military requirements. It is desirable to base all me military measures taken on in existing international law. However, measures which are considered necessary from a military point of view. Provided a decisive success can be expected from them, will have to be carried out even if they are not covered by existing international law. The next page, in principle, therefore, any means of warfare which is effective in breaking enemy resistance should be used on some <coughs> legal conception, the nature of which is not specified, even if that entails the creation of a new code of naval warfare. The Supreme War Council uh, will have to decide 
what measures of military and legal nature of the military and legal nature are to be taken. Once it has been decided to conduct economic warfare in its most ruthless form, in fulfillment of military requirements, this decision is to be adhered to under all circumstances. And under no circumstances may such a decision for the most ruthless form of economic warfare, once it has been made, be dropped or released under political pressure from neutral powers. That is what happened in the World War to our own detriment. Every protest by neutral powers must be turned down. Even threats of further countries, including the United States, coming into the war, which can be expected with certainty should the war last a long time, must not lead to a relaxation in the form of economic warfare once embarked upon. The more ruthlessly economic warfare is waged, the earlier will it show results and the sooner will the war come to an end. The economic effect of such military measures on our own war economy must be fully recognized and compensated through immediate reorientation of German war economy and the redrafting of the respective agreements with neutral states. For, and these are the final words, for this strong political and economic pressure must be employed if necessary. I submit that those comments are most revealing. And uh, the general submission of the prosecution is that as an active member of the inner councils of the Nazi state, right up to 1943, Rader, holding such ideas as those, must share responsibility for the many war crimes committed by his confederates and their underlings in the course of the war. But quite apart from this overall responsibility of Rader, there are certain crimes which the prosecution submits were essentially initiated and passed down the naval chain of command by Radar himself. I refer to the document C27 at page 7 of the document book, which will be G225. GB225. Those uh, are minutes of a meeting between Hitler and Rader on the 30th of December 1939. Page 7 of the document book. I will read with the court's approval the second paragraph beginning the chief of the naval war staff requests that full power be given to the naval war staff in making any intensification suited to the situation and to the means of war. The Führer fundamentally agrees to the sinking without warning of Greek ships in the American prohibited area and of neutral ships in those sections of the American prohibited area in which the fiction of mine danger can be upheld. For example, the Bristol <coughs> Channel. At this time, of course, as the tribunal knows, Greek ships were also neutral. And I submit that this is yet another demonstration of the fact that Radar was a man without principle. This incitement to crime was, in my submission, a typical group effort. Because in the document C12, which is at page one of the document book, 
the tribunal will see that a directive to the effect of those naval views was issued on the 30th of December 1939 by the OKW being signed by the defendant Yodel. And that document C12 will be GB226. Uh, it is an interesting document. It is dated the 30th of December 1939 and it reads on the 30th of December page. on page page one of the document book, my lord. The very first document in the book. On the 30th of December 1939, according to a report of Oberbefehlshaber uh, der Marine, the Führer and Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces decided that one Greek merchant ships in the area around England, declared by USA to be a barred zone, are to be treated as enemy vessels. Two, in the Bristol Channel, all shipping may be attacked without warning, where the impression of a mining incident can be created. Both measures are authorized to come into effect immediately. Another example of the callous attitude of the German Navy when it was under Raider's command towards neutral shipping is found in an entry in Yodel's diary. I think perhaps you ought to read the pencil note, oughtn't you? On that document. The pencil note on the document C12 reads, add to one, attack must be carried out without being seen. The denial of the sinking of these steamships, in case the expected protests are made, must be possible. As I was saying, Lord, another example of the callous attitude of Raider's Navy towards neutral shipping is found in an entry in Yodel's diary for the 16th of June, 1942, at page 112 of the document book. It is exhibit 1807 PS will be GB227. It is dated, this extract from Yodel's diary is dated the 16th of June, 1942. It reads, the operational staff of the Navy, SKL, applied on the 29th May for permission to attack the Brazilian Sea and Air Forces. The SKL considers that a sudden blow against the Brazilian naval and merchant ships is expedient at this juncture. A, because defense measures are still incomplete. B, because there is the possibility of achieving surprise. And C, because Brazil is to all intents and purposes fighting Germany at sea. <coughs> this, the tribunal will see, was a plan of a kind of Brazilian Pearl Harbor because the tribunal will recollect that war did not in fact break out between Germany and Brazil until the 22nd of August, 1942. Rader himself also caused the Navy to participate in war crimes ordered by other conspirators. And I shall give one example only of that. On the 22nd of October, 1942, as the document C-179 
US 543, at page 63 of the document book shows, the head of the operations division of the naval war staff promulgated to Hitler's, uh, promulgated to naval commands Hitler's notorious order of the 18th of October 1942 with regard to the shooting of commandos, uh, which in my submission amounted to denying the protection of the Geneva Convention to captured commanders. The tribunal will remember the document. It is dated the 28th of October 1942, and it reads, enclosed, please find a Führer order regarding annihilation of terror and sabotage units. This order must not be distributed in writing by flotilla leaders, section commanders, or officers of this rank. After verbal distribution to subordinate sections, the above authorities must hand this order over to the next highest section, which is responsible for its confiscation and destruction. What clearer indication could there be than the nature of these instructions as to the naval command's appreciation of the wrongfulness of the murderous Hitler order? Shall I we, shall... Shall we adjourn now for 10 minutes, Your Lordship, please? I have drawn the tribunal's attention to the circulation of Hitler's order to shoot commandos, and I now draw to the tribunal's attention an example of the execution of that order by the German Navy during the period when Rada was its commander. My learned friend, Mr. Roberts, has already given the tribunal an account of a commando operation of December 1942, uh, which had as its objective an attack on shipping in Bordeaux Harbor. The tribunal will recollect that the Wehrmacht account that he quoted, UK 57, exhibit GB 164, stated that six of the ten participants in that commando raid were arrested and that all were shot on the 23rd of March, 1943. In connection with that episode, the prosecution has a further document throwing more light on this Bordeaux incident and showing how much more expeditiously the Navy under Raider had implemented Hitler's order on this particular occasion. And I draw the court's attention to the document C-176 at page 61 of the document book. It will be exhibit GB-228. That document consists of extracts from the war diary of Admiral Bachmann, who was the uh, German flag officer in charge, Western France. The entry, the first entry at page 61 is dated the 10th of December, 1942, <coughs> and reads about 10.15, telephone call from personal representative of the officer in charge of the security service in Paris, SS Obersturmführer Dr. Schmidt to flag officer in charge, flag lieutenant, requesting postponement of the shooting as interrogation had not been concluded. After consultation with the chief of operations staff, the security service had been directed to get approval direct from headquarters. 1820, Security Service Bordeaux requested Security Service authorities at Führer's headquarters 
to postpone the shooting for three days. Interrogations continued for the time being. The next day, the 11th of December, 1942, shooting of the two prisoners was carried out by unit, strength one officer, 16 other ranks, belonging to the naval officer in charge, Bordeaux, in the presence of an officer of the security service, Bordeaux, on order of the Führer. Then there is a note in green pencil in the margin opposite the above entry. Security service should have done this phone flag officer in charge in, pure, in future cases. And as the tribunal knows, in future cases, it was in fact ordered that commandos should be handed over to the security service to be shot. The tribunal will therefore see from this document C-176, that the first two gallant men to be shot from the Bordeaux operation were actually put to death by a naval firing party on the 11th of December, 1942. They were Sergeant Wallace and Marine Ewart, who had the misfortune to be captured on the 8th of December in the preliminary stages of the operation. Of interest is the comment of the Naval War Staff upon this shooting, which is found in document D-658. Um, Mr. Owen Jones, what do the last two words mean, uh, uh, the last two lines, about the operation being particularly favoured? The operation was particularly favoured by the weather conditions and the dark night. That, presumably, my Lord, is a reference to the operation of the marine commandos in successfully blowing up a number of German ships in Bordeaux Harbor. Well, or right. alternately, I'm, I'm advised by uh, the naval officer who is assisting me that it probably is a reference to the conditions prevailing at the time of the shooting of yes. the two men. I should have thought so. And uh, I stand corrected by the British Navy uh, upon my interpretation of the matter. You put that to cloak the fact that naval men had done it? It, 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 it was, the, the uh, shooting was in fact, as the entry on the 11th of December shows, carried out by a naval party, by units belonging to the naval officer in charge at Bordeaux. I was seeking to draw the tribunal's attention to the comment of the naval war staff upon that shooting, which is in the document D-658 at page 109. The exhibit GB-229. And it, it reads, the naval commander, West France, reports that during the course of the day, explosives with magnets to stick on, mapping material dealing with the mouth of the Gironde, aerial photographs of the port installations at Bordeaux, camouflage material and food and water for several days were found. Attempts to salvage the canoe were unsuccessful. The naval commander, West France, has ordered that both soldiers be shot immediately for attempted sabotage. If their interrogation, which has begun, confirms what has so far been discovered. Their execution has, however, been postponed in order to obtain more information. According to a Wehrmacht report, both soldiers have meanwhile been shot. The measure would be in accordance with the Führer's special order, but is nevertheless something new in international law, since the soldiers were in uniform. And I submit that that last sentence shows very clearly that the naval high command under Raider accepted allegiance to the Nazi conspiracy as of greater importance than any question of moral principle or of professional honor and integrity.
this uh, operation of the shooting of those two commandos was, as I submit, not an act of war, but a murder of two gallant men. And it is upon this somber note that it is my duty to summarize this part of the prosecution's case against the defendant Rader. The prosecution's submission is that he was not just a military puppet carrying out political orders. The tribunal has seen that before the Nazis came, he had worked actively to rebuild the German Navy behind the back of the Reichstag. When the Nazis seized power, he unreservedly joined forces with them. He was the prime mover in transferring the loyalty of the German Navy to the Nazi party. He was as much a member of the inner councils of the Nazis as possibly any other defendant. And uh, he was a member of their main political advisory bodies. He was perfectly well aware of their aggressive designs and uh, I submit that he assisted in their realization not only as a military technician but also as a mendacious politician. And he furthered, as I have submitted, their brutal methods of warfare. And yet, uh, of all these conspirators, Raider was one of the first to fall from his high position. It is in fact true that the extension of the war beyond the boundaries of Poland came as a disappointment to Raider. His vision of a Nazi armada mastering the Atlantic, reckoned without Ribbentrop's diplomacy and Hitler's ideas of strategy. And I would draw the tribunal's attention to the document C-161 at page 35 of the document book, which is an extract, exhibit GB-230, from a memorandum by Rader, dated the 10th of January, 1943, just before his retirement, and entitled The Importance of German Surface Forces for Conducting the War by the Powers Signatory to the Three Power <coughs> Pact. The material entry reads, it was planned by the leaders of the National Socialist Reich to give the German Navy by 1944 to 1945, such a strength that it would be possible to strike at the British vital arteries in the Atlantic with sufficient ships, fighting power, and range. In 1939, the war having begun five years earlier, the construction of these forces was still in its initial stages. So the tribunal will see from that document how completely Rader was cheated in his ambitious plans by a miscalculation as to when his high seas fleet would be required. The tribunal has seen that Rader made a great effort to recover some of his lost glory with his attack on the inoffensive Norway. He made many efforts to liven up the war at sea both at the expense of neutrals and also of the customs and the laws of the sea. But his further schemes were disregarded by his fellow conspirators and in January 1943, Rader retired and thereafter he was a leader in name only. <coughs> I invite the court's attention to the document D655 at page 108 of the document book, exhibit GB231, which is a record in Rader's handwriting of his interview with Hitler on the 6th of January, 1943, which led to Rader's retirement. I'm only proposing to read the fifth paragraph. 
which Rader records, if the Führer was anxious to demonstrate that the parting was of the friendliest and wished that the name Rader should continue to be associated with the Navy, particularly abroad, it would perhaps be possible to make an appointment to General Inspector, giving appropriate publicity in the press, etc. But a new Commander-in-Chief Navy with full responsibility for this office must be appointed. The position of General Inspector, or whatever it was decided to call it, must be purely nominal. Hitler, the record reads, accepted this suggestion with alacrity. The general inspector could perhaps carry out special tasks for him, make tours of inspection, etc. The name Raider was still <coughs> to be associated with the, Germ with the Navy. After CNC Navy had repeated his request, the Führer definitely agreed to 30th January as his release date, he would like to think over the details. This was Raider's twilight, and indeed a very different occasion from the period of his ascendancy in 1939, when on the 12th of March, Raider spoke on the occasion of the German Heroes Day. And I now refer the court to the final document on Raider, an account of that speech in March 1939, which is at page 103 of the document book in the document D653, exhibit GB232. The first paragraph reads, throughout Germany, solemnities took place on the occasion of Hero Commemoration Day. On the 12th of March, 1939, these solemnities were combined for the first time with the freedom, with the celebration of the freedom to rearm. The day's chief event was the ceremony held in the Berlin State Opera House in Unter den Linden. In the presence of Hitler and representatives of the party and armed forces, General Admiral Rader made a speech, extracts from which are given below. I turn to page two of the record, page 104 of the document book, to about the 15th line. <coughs> National Socialism, says Rader, which originates from the spirit of the German fighting soldier has been chosen by the German people as its ideology. The German people follow the symbols of its regeneration with the same great love and fanatical passion. The German people has had practical experience of National Socialism, and it has not been imposed, as so many critics believe. Uh, believe. The Führer has shown his people that in the National Socialist racial community lie the greatest and invincible sources of strength, whose dynamic power ensures not only peace at home, but also enables us to make use of all the nation's creative powers. There follow eulogies of Hitler and a sentence, few sentences below. This is the reason for the clear and unsparing summons to fight Bolshevism and international jury whose race-destroying activities we have sufficiently experienced on our own people. Therefore, the alliance with all similar-minded nations who, like Germany, are not willing to allow their strength dedicated to construction and peaceful work at home to be disrupted by alien ideologies as by parasites of a foreign race. Then a few sentences later, if later on we instruct in the technical handling of weapons, this task demands that the young soldier should also be taught national socialist ideology and the problems of life. This part of the task which becomes for us 
both the duty of honor and a demand which cannot be refused can and will be carried out if we stand shoulder to shoulder and in sincere comradeship to the party and its organization. Next sentence. The armed forces and the party thus become more and more united in attitude and spirit. And then just two sentences of the next page. Germany is the protector of all Germans within and beyond our frontiers. The shots fired at Almeria are proof of that. That, of course, is a reference to the bombardment of the Spanish town of Almeria carried out by a German naval squadron on the 31st of May, 1937, during the course of the Spanish Civil War. There are further references to the Führer and his leadership, and a final sentence of the first paragraph of page three, they all planted into a younger generation a great tradition of death for a holy cause, knowing that their blood will lead the way towards the freedom of their dreams. And the, my submission is that that speech of Raiders is the final proof of his deep personal involvement in the Nazi conspiracy. There is the mixture of heroics and fatalism that led millions of Germans to slaughter. There are the boasts of violence used on the people of Almeria. There is the lip service to peace by a man who planned conquest. Armed forces and party have become more and more united in attitude and spirit. There is the authentic Nazi voice. Then there is Raider's assertion of racialism. And finally, there is his anti-Semitic gesture, Raider's contribution to the outlook that produced Belson. Imbued with these ideas, Raider became an active participant on both the political and military level in the Nazi conspiracy to wage wars of aggression and to wage them ruthlessly.